Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our international ground rounds, Associazione Nasosano. I'm very glad today one of our uh, international panelists is a Professor Hossam El Sharif. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So, um, me and Hossam been uh, in contact since 2015. I remember him visiting Varese while I was in there, and uh, he assessed, uh, he attended some courses for the Milano Masterclass. He's part of the team from Egypt, and I requested him to today for having a talk regarding some complication that we might encounter in during our activities, daily activities on rhinology. As, as many of you are aware, complications could happen. Complications could happen because of infections from uh, infection due from other causes. So today, Hassam is going to go ahead and talk about different presentation and how to manage those complications. So be aware that uh, this um, topic is going for 30, 35 minutes, then we will leave the time for 10, 15 minutes for question and answer. So please, for anyone interested, please type your answer and, uh, sorry, type your questions above over here. If anyone's attending from YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, please type your question and we will reply to all of them. So if we, if you're ready, uh, Hassan, please share your screen and let's start the journey. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'll start uh, my presentation today about um, Complications of sinusitis. Uh, orbital complication of sinusitis and endoscopic management. My name is Hossam Sharif. I uh, from the OR department, Tanta University from Egypt, and uh, this is the logo of my university. And uh, I'm proud to be a member of the Egyptian Rhinology Society and uh, Arab uh, uh, Rhinology Society. So uh, first, uh, we talk about some anatomical uh, consideration. I'm sorry, I where is my screen? So we have the anatomical considerations over here. I, I, I lost my, my, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. If you want, you can stop the, this, the sharing screen okay. and then okay. upload it again, okay. no rush. Okay. Okay. Perfect, great. You, you. I think that you're a little bit more advanced yes, right now. Yes, I will go back. Okay. So uh, we all know that the orbit, the orbit is isolated from the sinus infection by the lamina fibrillaria and by the uh, underlying periorbital. And we know that the periorbital will continue anteriorly. Here is the periorbital continue anteriorly, and that the orbital rim it becomes attached to what's called the orbital septum. This is very important. The orbital septum attaches inferiorly to the tarsal plate. So the orbital septum is separating infection which occurs anterior to it in the in the in the eyelid from infection which occurs inside uh, the orbit. And uh, uh, that's uh, very important information. Uh, how can I? Okay, I will go with the arrow. And uh, we all know that the orbital uh, complication of sinusitis is the uh, uh, most common. The uh, complication of sinusitis could be orbital or intracranial, which is 15 to 20 percent. Orbital complication are 60 to 70 percent, and bony complication of 5 to 10 percent. In radiography, we depend on CT scan with contrast, and it's very important to to do it with contrast. It is the best for orbital uh, complications. If you suspect intracranial complication, it's better to do MRI. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, more uh, helpful during uh, intracranial complications. Regarding the microbiology, um, uh, just a, a short note about the microbiology is that uh, usually when you are dealing with complications, you, ha you are dealing with uh, gram-positive, gram-negative, and most, pro most importantly, the anaerobes. So when you are prescribing antibiotic for complicated sinusitis, it's, it's uh, better to 
uh, add something to cover the anaerobic infection like uh, uh, metronidazole. So regarding the orbital complication, the routes of spread, we have two main routes of spread, either direct spread with the uh, organism we go through as rheumatic or congenital dehiscent, or it's a retrograde thrombophobitis, <clears throat> most commonly it occurs through the ismoidal vessels. And this is the uh, Chandler's classification. This is a very important classification it's from 1970, but uh, uh, this is the most uh, commonly used between uh, ENT uh, doctors. Group one is the preceptal cellulitis. Uh, uh, this is anterior to the orbital septum. And then group two is orbital cellulitis, subperiosteal abscess, orbital abscess, cavernous sinus thrombosis. We will go through this uh, very uh, quickly. And this is a very important slide. I would like to uh, all the residents to know this by heart. If you are doing a CT scan with contrast, it's very important to recognize three fat planes in this section. Three fat planes. This is the periorbita, and it attaches here to the orbital septum. This is the orbital septum. So we have three fat planes here. First one is called the preceptal fat plane. The fat appears black. Second uh, plane is called the postseptal fat plane, and this one. And third one is called the intraconal fat plane. So whenever a resident is uh, telling me about a complication, I ask him is, uh, about the CT scan. If the infection is preceptal, then it's mild infection. The, the patient can be treated uh, at home and uh, come for follow up in the hospital. If the infection is behind the orbital septum, like uh, post septum, in this fat plane or in this one, all these in the kind of complication should be hospitalized. So very important to recognize the preceptal fat plane, the postseptal, and uh, because this will uh, uh, help you in the um, uh, differentiating between the different uh, stages of uh, Chandler classification. So let's go to the first uh, um, the first stage, preceptal cellulitis. Patient come in uh, like this. There is no pain. The vision is okay. There is no pain. Only eyelid edema and the erythema. It's not painful, but it's, uh, it's usually uh, <clears throat> the patient will come because he sees his eye like this when he cannot open the eye actually from the edema. If you do a CT scan, then you will see uh, that the preceptal compartment, like here, the preceptal compartment is infiltrated with uh, uh, infection in the preceptal compartment, but still you can uh, detect the postceptal compartment. So the infection is limited to the uh, anterior uh, part of the of the, the eyelid, and this is not serious because it's not affecting the orbit actually, and uh, uh, it's uh, it's uh, the first stage or what we call preceptal. So let's go to the uh, second stage. Preceptal cellulitis, as I told you, is uh, uh, we need intravenous antibiotic headbed, elevation, warm compressors, and uh, nasal decongestant, mucolytic saline irrigation. And usually we, know, we don't do any surgical interference in this stage. Orbital cellulitis, edema and inflammation of the orbital contents without abscess formation, the eyelid edema and erythema, proptosis and chemosis, limited or no extraocular movement. And very important, if you look at the CT scan here, this is an axial CT scan. And the orbit here, you can see that the preceptal, the preceptal uh, fat is infiltrated as well as the postceptal. So uh, uh, preceptal and postceptal, this means an orbital uh, cellulite. Uh, uh, regarding the subperiosteal abscess, here there is a, a, a pus collection. And there is uh, uh, abscess that you can see if you are giving contrast, and this is this is the main advantage of the contrast that you will see a peripheral enhancement in the abscess. Like here in this in this part, in the, if it, it forms in the ismoid, it will push the globe uh, uh, forward, downward, and laterally. If it occurs in the from the frontal sinus, like this one, if it's uh, medial and uh, uh, above the orbit, it will push the orbit uh, downward and laterally. If it's from the maxillary sinus like this one, it will push the, uh, the uh, eye globe upward and forward. So you'll find uh, proptosis in all cases, but the direction of proptosis differs according to the site of the abscess. You will also see chemosis and osteoplasia. The complication of subperiosteal abscess it may rupture. If it ruptures inside the, the globe, you will have what we call orbital abscess or the next stage. 
if the uh, infection may extend intracranially and cause intracranial complication, and the risk of blindness comes from uh, compression of the optic nerve, like this, if it's posterior, like here, here's the orbital, ap optic, uh, orbital apex, that here the compression can lead to uh, blindness or sometimes to care by uh, toxic uh, neuritis. Here we have uh, a subperiosteal abscess. Uh, as you can see here, the post-septal compartment, we still have the, the post-septal compartment, but we have here um, uh, the abscess near to the lamina fibratia, and you can see here what we call obtuse angle. There is obtuse angle between the, the, the orbital wall and the abscess. And usually we can see it better. Sometimes we can see peripheral enhancement in this abscess. But the intraconal uh, fat is preserved. This is the optic nerve. Intraconal fat is preserved, and uh, it's limited to this abscess. Orbital abscess is more dangerous, but within the orbital contents, resulting from progression of the uh, infection, it causes severe exophthalmos and chemosis, ophthalmoplegia, visual impairment, and can spontaneously drain to the eyelid, as you can see here. So uh, in, in CT scan, you have this uh, uh, severe form of uh, infection, which uh, occurs inside the, the eye globe. There is usually there is severe proptosis, like here. This is the interzygomatic line. And uh, here, uh, uh, there is no, uh, you can think that this is a subperiosteal abscess, but if you look at the angle between the orbital wall and uh, and the abscess, it's not obtuse, it's a sharp angle. It's differentiating the uh, orbital cellulite, the orbital abscess from the subperiosteal abscess. Uh, and the last stage is called the cavernous sinus thrombosis, and this is the most uh, dangerous orbital pain, proptosis, and chemosis, and ophthalmoplegia, and symptoms in contralateral eye associated with sepsis and meningitis. It's uh, uh, very important to see how the uh, cavernous sinus look in the normal CT, normal MRI, and uh, normal CT scan. Here in uh, CT scan, you can see that the contrast is filling the sinus, the cavernous bilateral. So uh, CT was contrast axial, and here the uh, contrast is filling the sinus bilaterally. Here we have a uh, filling defect in the sinus. The sinus here is larger than the sinus in the right side. And this large size of the sinus with no filling can be uh, indicative of a thrombosis inside the cavernous sinus. Uh, but MRI is more helpful. If you have MRI like this one, this is a T1 weighted images of the, uh, with axial cuts, and uh, here you can see uh, an opacity fill the uh, sphenoid. Here there is an opacity, there is pus inside the sphenoid, and here is that's very important. It indicates that there is uh, uh, thrombosis, and here we have. of the cavernous sinus thrombosis. Uh, this is uh, an algorithm. Algorithm, how to treat this uh, infection. You have to admit all cases except minor preceptal inflammation, minor preceptal inflammation, uh, ENT, endoscopy, and ophthalmic opinion, visual assessment every 30 minutes and first 24 hours, uh, intravenous antibiotics, Energetics, and uh, then you classify the patient. If they have bilateral visual and neurological signs, symptoms of cavernous sinus thrombosis, this is uh, emergency CT, intravenous and antibiotics, staph uh, cover, and surgical drainage. If they have uh, visual acuity falling or gun, this is also an emergency. You have 100, uh, one, 100 minutes, sometimes it's 90 minutes to save the eye. Uh, if the visual uh, acuity is okay, but color vision uh, is okay, but significant proptosis, you can still have time. You do CT scan and uh, give antibiotic, and uh, uh, if it doesn't improve or localize, then you go to surgical drainage. So uh, the, the treatment depends mainly uh, on the uh, condition of the eye, the stage, and then, if you, for example, if you have uh, preceptor cellulitis, you, you don't have to admit. Otherwise, you admit the patient. Then you assess together with the ophthalmologist, and uh, uh, you start uh, uh, classifying the patient accordingly.
Uh, now we'll see some examples of, uh, of patients. This is the first case. This is a 16 years old male. This patient is uh, mentally uh, retarded. He has history of left gradual prostosis for years. And uh, suddenly, uh, two days ago, he started to develop severe prostosis with late edema and congestion. Two days uh, ago, severe pain uh, uh, following a common cold. The patient has decreased visual acuity and restricted uh, eye movement. So this is a CT scan of the patient. Here we have this huge uh, collection. This is uh, uh, a mucosyl, and most probably this is an old mucosyl. And the patient uh, with common cold, they developed the infection inside the mucosyl, so we start to have a second lesion. This is a second lesion. This is a sub abscess here. So uh, we have two lesions. We have the mucosyl, the original mucosyl, and then we have a sub abscess. Uh, so we we uh, if you look also here in this uh, axial cut, it's uh, it's more uh, prominent. Here we have the mucus here, and here we have the subperiosteal abscess, and the subperiosteal abscess is compressing is compressing actually the uh, the uh, optic nerve, and this may be the cause of decreased uh, visual acuity. So during surgery, we have to drain these two lesions. The first lesion, the mucosyl, and the second lesion, the subperiosteal abscess. So if we look at this uh, and, uh, uh, video, this is the left side of the nose, and this is the middle term. This is the... And here first, first we open the mucosyl, and as you can see, we have a large amount of mucopurulent discharge coming from the uh, mucosyl. We have to make a uh, marsupialization, wide opening, to avoid recollection of the mucosyl. This is the nasopharynx. And this is the view inside the mucosyl. Here you can see the uh, orbit. This is com a compression of the orbit. The laminar ratio is deficient here. We have the ismoidal vessels, the anterior ismoid to serous ismoid. And we have here the uh, posterior, uh, posterior table, frontal sinus, anterior wall, and the apex of the uh, of the frontal sinus. And uh, sec, we have opened the second lesion. So we are here. We are doing uh, complete fest. We this is the uh, nasopharynx, middle meter androstomy, sphenoidotomy. We are completing the uh, ismoidectomy, and then we open the lamina papyracea. Once we opened the lamina papyracea, we started to have this uh, pus coming behind from behind the lamina papyracea. This pus is coming from behind. If you if you look at the lamina papyracea, you will see that the fluid is coming from behind on compressing the orbit. So this is the sub periosteal abscess or the second lesion. But to ensure uh, that this lesion is completely uh, drained and it, it will not uh, recollect again, we have to remove this part of the lamina papyracea. The, the superior part is already uh, dehiscent from the mucosyl, but this part, behind this part, we have the abscess. So uh, to, to, re to remove the, the lamina papyracea, we are using this jcurette to elevate the lamina papyracea. The most important point in this uh, situation to preserve the periorbita because the periorbita is the barrier against in, uh, spreading of infection inside the orbit. So are you, if you are removing parts of the lamina ratio, take care to preserve uh, the periorbita because it is uh, the barrier. Avoid the protrusion of fat in this uh, situation. And this is the situation after completely decompressing the orbit. And this is the, the orbit, this is the sphenoid, skull base, and um, the uh, maxillary sinus and the nasopharynx. Um, let's move to the second case. This is the patient. This is the patient before operation, and this is the patient after three days during removal of the pack. Uh, he, he was completely uh, improved after draining this lesion. This is the second case. Uh, actually, this is the three months old infant who came to our hospital with dry, rapidly progressive proptosis, marked leaked edema and erythema, uh, conjunctival edema and chemosis with minimal response after 48 hours of antibiotics. 
we were thinking to uh, what what is the situation this child we we saw that uh, ct first and uh, we wait for the ct this is the ct of the child of the infant he it doesn't have much uh, of uh, baronasal sinus the uh, air cells and here we have the ismoidal bulla on the left side here we have the ismoidal bulla on the right side so uh, here we have also ismoidal air cells on the left side here the ismoidal air cells are uh, diseased we have some sinusitis in the ismoidal bulla we thought to uh, drain this endoscopically so uh, because the, the nose is very small we are using uh, ear instruments uh, using ear instrument, this is a crocodile, the ear uh, from the ear set. Uh, this is the middle turbinate, and here we have the bulla ismoidalis. So the first step will be to open, opening the bulla ismoidalis, and using the metallic suction tip from ear instrument, we are uh, making uh, perforation of the lamina for, of the uh, ismoidal bulla. After opening the ismoidal bulla, we have to open also the uh, uh, lamina pericia, and here after opening the lamina pericia, removing a part of the bone, and we start to compressing uh, the orbit, and uh, uh, and finally we have the pus coming from uh, the orbit. This was a subperiosteal abscess. After removing part of the lamina pericia, we could drain the uh, abscess endoscopically through the nose and uh, more compression of the orbit and re relieving the uh, pressure. And finally, this will be the final situation. This is the lamina vibratia. Lamina this is the vibratia after removal. This is the periorbita. We still have some uh, pass here. This is the uh, periorbita intact. Pass is, is mainly collecting between the, the bone, the lamina vibratia, and the periorbita. And this is the child uh, completely normal after one or two months. So this is the third case. This is a 43-old female, left-sided sudden onset uh, progressive eye edema and the congestion and proptosis with decreased visual acuity and restriction of eye movement. Whenever you have uh, decreased visual acuity or you have uh, uh, subperiosteal uh, abscess, if you have abscess in the CT, this is uh, mandatory for uh, intervention. If you have decreased visual acuity or decreasing visual acuity or loss of vision, these all are emergency for immediate uh, interference of the case. So here in this patient, we have a very interesting uh, observation. It, it was mainly from the maxillary sinus, but we have here an air forming organism. As you can see here, the orbit is filled with gases. Uh, as you can see here, a pus and air forming organism. And you can see here. So we started, we started uh, immediately, we, the patient went to the operation. This is the left side of the nose again. We're starting here to do uh, lateralize, uh, sorry, medialize the middle tablet. This is the unseen process. Just compressing the unseen process, we start to have a huge amount of pus. Uh, these cases are usually, uh, the bleeding in these cases is usually uh, severe because all tissues are inflamed. Uh, it, it needs a uh, uh, more experienced uh, surgeon. It's not suitable for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, I mean, for uh, uh, a resident, for example, uh, a new resident. You have to, to be a little bit experienced because you are dealing with a severe infection and you, usually you have severe bleeding during these uh, procedures. So after opening the maxillary sinus, we found here a fungal bowl, fungal bowl and a huge pus. The nose to find mixed pathology. We have a lot of cases with mixed pathology, fungal and bacterial at the same time. So after uh, after uh, removal of this uh, fungus and removal of pus, I'm starting to to see the defect. From the CT scan, I know that there is a defect at the roof of maxillary sinus through which the uh, infection is spread to the uh, orb. So completing the first, completing the first uh, um, ismoidectomy, 
and uh, and two serous modectomy. I, I can go forward. And two on two serous modectomy. As you can see here, the tissue is edematous. There is a lot of bleeding. But now we can see the lamina cutricia. This is the uh, sphenoid completing the ismoid. And now, now we started to compress the orbit, and suddenly we had this huge amount of pus coming from a defect in the roof of the maxillary sinus. Uh, more compression of the, of, the, of the orbit, we started to have this huge amount of pus, pure pus coming from the orbit. This is the maxillary sinus again. This is the maxillary sinus, this is sphenoid sinus, and this is the nasopharynx. And uh, my assistant is compressing the orbit, and here we have a defect through which the, uh, we have this huge amount of pus again, sphenoid sinus, maxillary sinus. And we still have, with compressing the orbit, we still have amounts of pus coming, different colors, different uh, consistencies. We have to, to wash uh, the sinus because we had a large uh, fungal ball here and severe infection. And in the orbit, we need more radical, more radical uh, intervention. This uh, case ended with a uh, uh, medial, medial medulectomy. And this is the patient before the operation, and this is the patient at the time of removal of the back, which is my, my very uh, good improvement. Uh, and all these cases, the, in all these cases, the vision improved. Uh, post operative. This is a uh, young uh, adult male, 24 old male, common or cold 10 days ago, the right sided headache and facial uh, pain five days ago, uh, and two days ago, eyelid edema and proptosis, and no improvement with medical treatment. Let's look at the CT scan. Uh, sorry, left sided. Left sided, uh, left side of the sinuses is completely uh, opacified, right side is okay. But here inside the orbit, we have something uh, like subprostate abscess in the medial, uh, medial uh, wall and in the uh, uh, floor of the orbit also, medial wall and floor. Uh, it is connected to this, to this infection in the sinus. So let's see the. Uh, it, it's almost the same the same technique. This is the left side of the nose. This is the uh, unsinate process. The unsinate is edematous and swollen, and this is the middle turbinate. Middle turbinate, unsinate process. So the first, uh, first is unsinectomy. Start and when starting unsinectomy, you start to have this uh, pus coming from the maxillary sinus. So uh, cleaning the maxillary sinus. Then uh, we had to resect a part of the middle turbulent because it was obstructing uh, the view. Here we have the sphenoid sinus. And then we uh, penetrate the lamina fibrisia to drain the subprostial abscess. So uh, steps is uh, complete first at the beginning, and then we open the lamina fibrisia to drain the abscess. This is the pus coming from uh, a subprostial uh, abscess. So this is the lamina fibrisia. I'm trying to decompress the orbit and uh, uh, remove the abscess completely. This is the periorbita. I'm trying to keep the periorbita intact uh, all the time because it's a, a barrier against infection. So only only the uh, lamina fibrisia. Carefully, you remove the lamina fibrisia from the periorbita, and you can uh, remove it. Um, Continuing uh, here on the decompression, this is the uh, orbit after decompressing the orbit and removing of the lamina pericia. But uh, in this case, after uh, decompression and removal of the lamina pericia, uh, compressing, we're putting our finger and trying to compress the orbit. We, we see that the orbit is not compressed yet. So uh, when we started to open the periorbita because we thought we have an abscess inside the orbit, when we open the uh, periorbita, this is the second knife. I'm trying to make incisions in the uh, periorbita and decompressing the uh, compression of the orbit. Again, we started to have this pure pus coming out from the from the orbit. So if you if you feel after decompression of the orbit of the subperiosteal abscess, if you still have uh, 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 severe pressure inside the orbit. You may uh, you may do like this. Uh, you may uh, check if there is pus inside the orbit. 
because uh, sometimes the CT is a bit old. This is a sphoidal vessel. This is the anterior sphoidal uh, artery. This is the skull base, anterior sphoidal artery. So uh, the lamina pressure is complete. It is uh, decompressed to the uh, skull base. This is the skull base, sphoidal vessel, anterior sphoidal artery, and most probably the posterior sphoid will be like like here. Uh, after uh, completely uh, decompressing the orbit and opening the lamina pressure, we complete uh, complete the uh, fist. This is the uh, sphenoid sinus. This is the maxillary sinus. Maxillary sinus, sphenoid sinus, nasopharynx, and uh, the abscess is completely uh, decompressed. Uh, I, I don't want to be uh, long, but uh, I will I will continue with this uh, case. This is. Uh, a very nice child is one and a half years old uh, child who came with common colds. Well, common colds uh, one week ago, rapidly developed eyelid edema and proptosis for two days ago, admitted to the hospital. He was admitted to the ophthalmology department with antibiotics and there is no improvement. So when they consulted uh, ENT, when they consulted ENT, this was a uh, CT scan he had uh, before. You can see here that there is a subperiosteal abscess. There is still some of the post-septal fat here and here, but there is an abscess. It, uh, because this child doesn't have uh, IV contrast, so it, it's a bit difficult to see the wall of the abscess if you don't have contrast. But here, for sure, there is a subperiosteal abscess. Here, there is a subperiosteal abscess. It's collecting in the medial wall of the orbit and also in the superior wall of the, the superior wall of the orbit. So the the situation here: would you open from outside? Would you open the eyelid incision and open this child, or uh, you go with endoscope? Uh, it depends on the uh, if you have if you have uh, experienced the uh, surgeon in your team that can use the endoscope. You can go with the endoscope. If you don't, you can open from outside. It's okay, but the 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 important thing is to open this abscess. You can go from outside, Lynch uh, uh, incision or uh, orb, uh, eyelid incision, and you go for the medial wall of the orbit and drain the abscess, or you can do it from uh, uh, inside with the endoscope. We prefer to try with the endoscope. So uh, this was the child during the operation. Oh, uh, also, we used uh, 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 ear instruments. Once we, uh, there was huge bleeding in this case, and once we go, we was inside the middle meters, you can see here that we have necrotic tissue. Too much necrotic tissue, we have to remove. I'm putting here a cotton with uh, adrenaline uh, to uh, decrease the bleeding. We started to have this pus. It's coming from uh, most probably from maxillary sinus. So uh, I will I will go forward a little bit, opening the maxillary sinus. Again, we have a huge amount of pus coming from maxillary sinus, enlarging the middle meter antrostomy. And uh, then uh, this is the uh, bulla ismoidalis. Edematous tissue, uh, too much bleeding. The instruments are, are uh, not uh, um, helping you in, in young age. But finally, we can see that this is the lamina pericia. We started to decompress the lamina pericia. This is the periorbita here, the white, white color. As you can see here, using the uh, ear suction tip, I'm trying to decompress the uh, orbit, removing a small part of the lamina pericia, a part after the other. Uh, take your time. Uh, the most important, this is the periorbita. You have to keep it uh, intact. As you can see here, sometimes you need the three hands. There's one holding the suction and one taking the in scope and one uh, taking this small pieces um, of wood. This is the periorbita. Periorbita now is, it's evident. And uh, the child improved very much after. This is the, the photo after. Uh, one or two weeks. After one or two weeks, he became completely uh, normal, and this is the time of his discharge from the uh, hospital. So uh, 
with this case, I will uh, end my uh, presentation, but I would like to invite you all to uh, join us in the Rhino Egypt. Rhino Egypt uh, is the biggest rhinology uh, meeting in the Middle East. It, 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 every year we have it in the first week of March. And uh, we have a Facebook group called Rhino Egypt URL group for all uh, people interested in uh, rhinology, otology, head and neck, phoniatrics, and audiology. We would be glad to, to if you can join us in our group. And finally, I would thank you very much. Thank you uh, for, for, my, for the invitation, and uh, I'm very happy to be with you. Now we'll see the question. Thank you so much, Hashem, for the presentation. Um, we skip between the Chandler classification to assess the disease, then treatment, then surgical procedures, how to avoid stuff. So we have a complementary, a comprehensive debate on this, which is mandatory, I guess. So we have a, a different questions around. Uh, before going, uh, going forward, please, uh, um, if anyone is interested, you can subscribe to their Facebook pages and, uh, and get information regarding the um, activities from uh, Professor Hassan Sharif in the future. Uh, uh, they do in courses, congresses, uh, and dissection courses, so please do attend them. We encourage every teaching and educational program, so it's very, it's very useful for, for anyone. Um, so let's, let's go ahead for, with the questions. Uh, instead of many compliments, so we will start with a, with a question. So um, Yusuf Saleh asks, uh, um, please sharp demarcation bed for the preceptal, postceptal interconal. I don't, I don't get this question. Let's go, let's go to another question. Uh, Yosef said, do you recommend middle terminate resection for cases of mucosil to improve the postoperative drainage? Uh, yes, in, in cases of uh, frontoismoidal mucosil, I would like to resect a part of the middle turbulent. Of, of course, we don't resect the whole middle turbulent, only the bulbous, the bulbous anterior uh, part of the middle turbulent, uh, because the middle turbulent is an important uh, landmark. You will need it if you if you are doing uh, revision surgery in the future, and uh, the the superior part of the middle turbulent is uh, believed to have. Olfactory functions, olfactory mycelium and olfactory functions, it's very important you, you cannot resect. So if you want to resect only the anterior and the, and the inferior part of the middle turbulent, usually this part is bulbous. Sometimes with the inflammation, it's obstructing the view. So we uh, it's like trim, trimming. It's not resection of the middle turbulent, trimming of the anterior and the inferior part of the middle turbulent so that you can have better access and uh, uh, better marsupialization of the mucosil to avoid recollection. All right. Uh, then we have a question from Spain. Manuel is asking, are you suggesting CT scan or MRI for patients that is complaining diplopia? Uh, for, for orbital complication, CT is the best. Uh, CT with, with contrast. If you are doing CT with contrast, this is the best for uh, evaluation of, uh, of orbital complications. When you are suspecting intracranial complications, sometimes you ask for, uh, for MRI. So like, like cavernous sinus thrombosis, for example, you ask for, for, for MRI. So sometimes uh, CT alone, sometimes CT uh, complemented with MRI. Um, we have a question from United States. And uh, this uh, colleague is saying, how do you assess uh, uh, patients under six years old, of old age if you cannot perform endoscopy in them? Uh, if, uh, under six years, if you cannot do endoscopy? Yeah, if, I if, think that uh, what uh, yeah. uh, Yes, if, if, he, if, he, if it's not available, if you don't have the scope or uh, the facility or whatever, also, uh, the classic method is to open from outside, to, to drain the abscess from outside. So you go with incision. You, you may have the incision in the eyebrow, or you have, can have it uh, like Lynch incision. Then you go to the bone the, to reach to the, to the periorbiter, and you start to separate the, you from the plane between the bone and the periorbiter, and dissection here will be uh, easy. The only uh, problem is the, is the anterior smoother artery. But if you if you are a little bit inferior, you are away from uh, the artery. You can have 
uh, access to the uh, to the subpery osteal abscess if it's in the medial wall. If it's in the superior wall, it's the same, the same concept. You can open eyelid incision, go under the periorbita to the uh, to drain the abscess. Uh, then usually we put a drain at the end. We put a drain uh, from the wound and leave it for a few days to make sure that the abscess is completed. Uh, this uh, this was the classic method, and it's it's uh, if you don't have the facilities, the first the important thing is to save the eye to decompress the orbit. So uh, don't hesitate to do uh, open approach if you don't have in scope. Uh, there's no problem. And this incision, eye bound incision, is uh, usually it's hidden, and you cannot see it after a few few months. You actually so, uh, replied also to another question by the way because they were asking other techniques for that. Then we, we pass with this. Desiderius Chusi is asking, do you involve ophthalmology colleagues and what are the key aspects, areas that you strongly have to collaborate? Uh, um, usually I, 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 I involve in ophthalmology, uh, of course, because we, it's, it's mainly medical legal. You have to, to have uh, ophthalmology uh, colleague with you. Uh, and you have to uh, uh, to assess the visual acuity. Once the patient comes to the hospital, you have to assess visual acuity, uh, the uh, eye movement. All these things are examined by the ophthalmology. So the ophthalmology will assess first the visual acuity, will assess the movement of the of the eye in different direction, the external movement, the internal movement, and will assess the if if it's possible to assess uh, the fundus examination as well. And fundus examination can can tell a lot of information if it's possible. So uh, ophthalmology consultation is mandatory. It's not an option. It's mandatory. And at the time of entry to the hospital, you have to consult ophthalmology. Usually, we do the ophthalmology consultation every day. In the future, if you are going to give medical treatment, we consult ophthalmology every day. And after two days, if there is no improvement we uh, decide to uh, go for surgery. During surgery, we don't need actually the uh, ophthalmology. So the, the, the main role is uh, in, in uh, assessing the visual acuity and documenting all these things in the patient sheet, because this is a very important uh, issue for uh, medical legal uh, problems. So uh, before the patient, uh, uh, before the operation, you should have ophthalmology uh, report about the case. Don't uh, don't uh, do anything in the patient uh, drainage or whatever before ophthalmology uh, report because it will tell. For example, the vision is uh, is uh, hand movement is counting fingers or whatever, and then you you do another consultation after uh, the operation and document the. Uh, the vision after operation before discharging the patient from the hospital. This is very important for the patient and for you to protect you during uh, medical legal issues. But during surgery, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't uh, have ophthalmology colleague during surgery. Um, the question from Jacques from France, uh, he's asking, do you collect a swab from the pus? Uh, uh, sometimes, sometimes if I have the facility, you know, and uh, I collect, it's, it's not, it's not mandatory. But uh, I collect the pus sometimes. But the problem is that the patient usually, when he comes to the surgery, he had a lot of antibiotics the, before. In the at home, he had yeah. antibiotics. Then in the hospital, he have antibiotics. So the, the, it will not. If you do culture sensitivity, it will not be very specific. And we know from the literature that we have all, all the time we have a mixed infection in these cases. So uh, we, in my department, we have a protocol. We give uh, uh, antibiotics to cover gram-positive and gram-negative and, uh, and anaerobes. Uh, myself, I will give the patient uh, uh, third generation Kifaris for the for the gram-negative. And uh, sometimes metronidazole or uh, or uh, ampicillin uh, or amoxicillin clavulanic acid for the gram positive together with uh, metronidazole for anaerobic infections. And uh, IV antibiotics are the best in these cases. And after 48 hours, it is the time to decide if there is improvement and we'll continue on medical treatment or we will cut uh, medical treatment and go for the uh, theater to do uh, endoscopic drainage. 
I think that we have the time for the last question from the Netherlands. It's in fact pretty good. It's um, I would, the the colleague is asking, uh, would you perform in cases of uh, a mycotic involvement of the preceptal space? Uh, mycotic, mycotic. You mean fungal, fungal infection of the preceptal yes. space? Yes, you're sure for fungal infection. We, if, uh, we have a lot of fungal infection in my, in my country, and uh, we have a lot of fungal ball. We have a lot of uh, allergic fungal sinusitis. We have also these days we started to have chronic fungal sinusitis. So uh, a lot of time we are in, in the acute invasive all these cases. So we have uh, we have uh, some experience in dealing with uh, fungal infection. And uh, all the time they are surrounding the orbit. So sometimes they are surrounding the orbit. Sometimes they are surrounding the optic nerve itself. So you have to go around with the endoscope to to um, to uh, remove mycotic infection or fungal infection from uh, preceptal space. Sometimes from uh, around the optic nerve in the sphenoid or in this area. Uh, especially uh, cases of uh, acute I mean, I, it, it's not specific about certain type of fungal but if we, if i if i uh, if i have for example uh, acute invasive fungal sinusitis then i will go and remove uh, all the um, um, infected parts all the necrotic parts sometimes you have to remove the lamina pressure completely to remove the middle turbulent, inferior turbulent. Sometimes you do the brightness and remove even the maxillary, uh, the maxilla itself. You, sometimes you can do some maxillectomy during this debridement. So it, it depends on the type of fungal infection. In fungal bowl, it's enough to open the, the, the sinus and clean it completely. In allergic fungal, uh, the same, but in chronic invasive we, and uh, acute invasive, we have more more uh, aggressive form of fungal infection. But it's it's, it's common to to go to the the, uh, the subosteal space during the mycotic uh, infection. Yeah. So we we really really like for your presentation uh, for anyone interested there were some questions regarding pinpointing uh, structures so if anyone is interested all our um, topics and uh, meetings are available on our youtube channel you can go fast forward after the ending of this uh, talk to participate and watch it again thank you so much Hassan, for being with us Thank you so thank much you, for you, being yeah. present today uh, you. and, and you know, participating in this. You, of course, will be able to, um, uh, to participate in the future for other meeting too. Um, thank you so much again. I would uh, love uh, to have as soon as possible once again uh, to see each other. Uh, for those who interest, for those who's interested, we will announce uh, the next meeting on Friday for the schedule for the next week. And uh, a huge and a great news is coming next few, few weeks. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll talk to you and see you for the next upcoming meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye, Thank you. Hassan. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. -bye. Bye -bye.